Today we are continuing on the topic that we've started for some months and uh, you know we've been using this book uh, produced by Apostle Tim and the topic is Erased by the Cross. Erased by the Cross. You can find this on Amazon if you want. So that's what we've been using for our Sunday school. Today we will be starting chapter 3. Chapter 3 says the freedom from condemnation. Freedom from condemnation. And the verse, the main verse for the book itself is found in the book of Colossians chapter 2 verse 14 to 15. Colossians 2 verse 14 and 15. It says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us. And he took it out of the way, nailing it to this cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Here he's talking about what Jesus did for us on the cross. The significance of the cross is that was not an ordinary death. His life was unlike any other man. His purpose was because of the love that the Father has for us. So on the cross, his mission was accomplished. He knew that he would die on the cross. He knew that he would be accused of wrongdoing even when he did nothing. But this has been his goal all the way, to be tortured and to be killed like an ordinary sinner just because of the love that he has for us. By himself, he laid his life for us. When the time came, he surrendered himself. If that was not his time, there's nothing they could have done. If he has to disappear, it would disappear. But when the time came, he surrendered. And he did not insulate himself from the pain that people feel when they are tortured. He felt the pain. They mocked him, beat him. Gave him sour drink. Put thorns on him like a crown. Pierced his side and blood came out. I want you to imagine somebody knowing that that will happen and deliberately going through it. How do you feel when the exam is coming? An exam. As the day comes I mean, closer, you know the tension that builds up. Now imagine somebody that already knew the kind of death he would die. And this was a sinless man. So that means every day of his life, he knew what was going to happen. And he was getting closer to it every day. Do you think... It was easy. The kind of cry he was crying when the hour came. Of course, the disciples were asleep. And it was time to pray. He found them sleeping because they are not the one going through it. But he did it for you and for me. Let me read that again. 
He said, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he took it out of the way, nearly hit to his cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made the shoe of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Another version says, in this way, he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So on the cross, there was victory. On the cross, the work was finalized. It took power from the ruler of darkness and gave that power to us as his children. So today, we will continue in that. And uh, in section one of chapter three, which we are starting today, he says, breaking the chains of guilt and shame. Breaking the chains of guilt and shame. Indeed, going through shame and guilt is a chain. Which we must break free from. If you remain perpetually under shame and guilt, guess what happened? There is no energy to move forward. One's life will always be depressed, we will feel oppressed, we will feel tired. And unfortunately, many people have been going through this. The chain of guilt and shame. But I have good news for you. This is part of what Jesus did on the cross for us. He broke that chain. He took away the shame. So do you even realize this? Do you know that you are free? So why are you keeping yourself in bondage? You will be like that animal who has been in the cage for so long and somebody came to one corner, opened the gate. But that animal still remained in that cage. He refused to see the open gate. A way of escape. The hard part has been done. The cage has been opened. All you need to do is to step out. Step out. And receive your freedom. Before we proceed, can somebody help us? What is guilt and what is shame? How are they different? Uh, do we have somebody with the microphone? Thank you. What is guilt and what is shame? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Um, guilt is an offense. Okay. And shame is a humiliation. <laughs> Straight so, to the point. Okay. So one is something that you do mm -hmm. willfully, freely. The other one is how you feel after the fact. Um, some people don't have guilt or remorse. Um, but the Father is saying that they still have the opportunity to repent. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Uh, you went straight to it. Uh, what you did, good. How you feel, the shame. Do we have other contributors? What is guilt? What is shame? So I will say that um, guilt is how you feel after the act, mm -hmm. and shame is the the shame is. Oh, <laughs> 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 
So I, I will say that not everybody feels shameful for their acts, but somehow they might be guilty. They feel guilty of what they did, but they are not really shame. Like I'm not sorry. That is. So. Okay. Um, guilt. Mm -hmm. I say feeling bad, mm -hmm. feeling worried, sad about what one has done. Mm -hmm. And shame is when you feel embarrassed for what you have done. You don't want anyone to know what has really happened. Okay, you all did very well, and that is the definition. You see, both are feelings, both are emotions. But guilt is about the feeling you have for doing something you shouldn't have done. You know you shouldn't have done it. And you did it, then you feel guilty. Some don't know they are guilty until the court finds them guilty. <laughs> the ruling came that you did the wrong thing. Then shame, that feeling of regret for being an inadequate person. You are no longer yourself. You don't feel the same. So both go together. If you feel guilty, you are not happy. Then shame comes. If you don't feel guilty, no reason to be ashamed. Unfortunately, some people do the wrong thing. They don't feel guilty, and they are not ashamed of it. They don't. They're doing the wrong thing, and they are still proud about it. On the contrary, some people have no reason to remain guilty and ashamed. They could have failed that at a point. But when that reason for guilt and shame has been taken away, then why will you keep yourself perpetually in that horrible state? This is part of what Christ has come to accomplish for us on the cross. Did we do something that we are guilty of? Yes. Yes. She will be ashamed of what we did. Yes. But when somebody came to free you, then why don't you take this offer and get out of that feeling of guilt and shame that you have put yourself? Let's go through it. In the book of Genesis, chapter 3, remember the case of Adam and Eve. God gave them the instruction that that fruit at the center of knowledge of good and evil, you must not touch it. The day you eat out of it, you will die. That was a clear instruction. They can take of any other fruit. But you know, human being, that exact thing that you are told not to do. That's what you want to do. So they ate that fruit. That means they sinned. And because they sinned, they did something wrong. They are guilty. Now, because they did something wrong, what happened? Shame automatically came upon them. That was why they went to heat themselves, cover themselves with leaves. 
they wanted to hide from the Lord. When they didn't sin, there was no reason for shame. God has been having regular fellowship with them. They didn't even know they were naked. But when they sinned, guilt and shame came. Please don't put yourself into sin that exposes you. Because that's what it does. Don't put yourself into it. Sin is the root cause of guilt and shame. And this causes a separation between us and our God. Sin separates us between us and God. When God said they would die, it didn't mean they would fall down and just expire like that. But it means there will be a separation between them and God. They were driven away from that beautiful garden. They no longer see God like they used to. So that's applicable to us as well. When you don't do something that you should be proud of, by yourself you want to hide. You don't want any contact with other people. The book of Isaiah, chapter 59, Verse 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that he cannot save you, that he cannot save. Neither is his hair heavy, that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hid his phrase from you, that he will not hear. Your iniquities, your sins, has caused a separation between you and God. God is, God always wants to have a fellowship with his children. But he cannot stand sin. When we dip our hands into sin, we automatically bring a separation between us and God. The question is, how do we remedy this? What should we do? We have sinned. How do we regain that lost relationship with our Heavenly Father? The consequences of sin. Sin not only affects our relationship with God, but also with other, ourselves and others. It breeds feelings of unworthiness, self-condemnation, and alienation. That's what sin does. You condemn yourself. You isolate yourself. You feel unworthy. But the good news is Christ's sacrifice presented us a new opportunity. Somebody say amen. amen. Through his death and resurrection, Christ not only paid the penalty for our sins, but also imputed his righteousness to us. That is what his death and resurrection did. He paid for our sins. And he gave us his righteousness. We don't have the righteousness of our own. But we are declared righteous because of Christ. So don't continue to dwell in what you have done. 
and beat yourself up. Yes, you sinned. But the fact is, Christ died for you. You may feel unworthy, but you are loved by God because of the righteousness of Christ in you. That means if you don't accept Christ's sacrifice, you will still remain in your state of isolation, alienation from God. But once you accept Christ, you are clean. You are old, no matter what you have done. No matter what. And that's, that's one thing about God that you cannot just explain. It's not like a scale where God will say, all your good deeds in one pack, in one side, all your bad deeds on one side. Then let's look at the scale. Then if that's how God measures righteousness, that means you can sin. Just make sure you do good one. Add one to it so that <laughs> the scale will tilt on the right side. Right? That would be the smart thing to do. Let me sin for three days. Then for the rest of the week, do good. Or you can pay it forward, do good first. Say, so now, God, I have the license to say. <laughs> but that's not it. The good thing is that no matter how much sins that you have committed, the day you accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, genuinely repent and determine not to go back Please, all those things have to be there. Don't be like the thief that will come and pray to God on Sunday that I'm about to go and steal something. God help that they don't catch me. But that one is not ready to repent. It's just deceiving himself. When you genuinely repent, that means you're not going back. You are not going back. The scary part of it is that no matter how much good you've been doing, if you don't accept Christ, you've missed it all. So if you're in Christ, don't look back. Don't get tired. Don't say, let me go and taste the other world for a brief period, then I will come back to Christ. No, Satan is looking for that opportunity. That singular opportunity. When I think about this, I think of the case of uh, Cornelius. Was it Cornelius? Yes. This man was good. But something was lacking in his life. He didn't know Christ. And God so loved him that I didn't want him to die despite the good that he's been doing. That was why he sent Peter to him. And thank God he accepted the gospel. So people of God, Christ is our righteousness. Christ is our, not your good work, Not Christ is our righteousness. So what have you done that the enemy is using to keep you under, to keep you in that perpetual state of feeling of guilt and shame? The first thing is, have you accepted Christ? Do you accept his work on the cross? Have you repented? Are you determined to continue in him? then forget about what happened in the past. Apostle Paul did worse. Yeah, God forgave him and used him mightily. I don't know how many people you have killed. <laughs> but imagine Apostle Paul 
killing, and not just killing, killing the disciples, killing the children of God, people of the way. He was targeting them specifically, took it as a personal mission to go after Christians. Yet, he made Christ. And God changed him. And God used him. So how do we change from this state of perpetual guilt and shame into a life of freedom that Christ gave to us? How do we transition? Yes, ma'am. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. I love the word of God in John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he mm -hmm. gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. Mm -hmm. For God did not send his son into Hallelujah. the world to condemn the world, mm -hmm. but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, mm -hmm. but whoever does not believe stands condemned already. Mm. Amen. Amen. That's a good one. I thought you were going to talk a little bit more about that. But let's go back to it. John 3, I know we know 16 very well. But 17 is also important. He said, For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Not to condemn the world, but the what through him might be saved. Satan comes to condemn, to tell you of how horrible that you are, how bad a person that you are. He will even tell you, you are not a kind. You are not, the heaven is not for your kind. He will tell you, you are not righteous. You want to sing, he say, you? Remember what you did last week? And it takes away that joy from you. But Jesus has come to save. Yes, you did it, but he gave us victory. Amen. How do we transition from that state of guilt and shame to living free. Anybody? First of all, is to, to accept Jesus Christ as, as our Lord and Savior. Mm -hmm. That's first because uh, uh, the Bible, you know, understand that uh, in Second Corinthians five says that if anyone is in Christ. It's a new creature. All things are behold, new as God. So after I accept Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are new. And no more guilt. We are free from guilt. That's a good point. Thank you. God bless you, man. You are a new creation. If you are in Christ, there is a transition. Everything has become new. It's like you never did it. So the first thing you have to do is to be in Christ. That takes you to a new face, a new life, a new being. You must be in Christ. You must be in Christ. That's how you transition. Yes, sir, you want to add? Yes, um, mm -hmm. I, I just want to say sometimes another aspect is even when you're in Christ, mm -hmm. you we have to learn to forgive yourself because guilt, it's like a sense of responsibility that I did something and you ascribe that responsibility to yourself mm -hmm. and that's where shame 
comes from because you said something about feeling inadequate. That's where it's like, I should have known better. You start thinking this way. But more than sometimes forgiving others, forgiving yourself is tougher. So to get rid of guilt, you also have to think about that. You need to forgive you for whatever harm you feel you may have caused for yourself or for others because that's where that thing, the enemy keep reminding us over and over again because you really haven't forgiven yourself. Hmm. Amen. Amen. Thank you for that point. God bless you, sir. You see, actually, when we think of what we have done, we should not be proud of it. We should be ashamed of it. We should get to a point where we realize that what we did was bad. And now we are ready for a change. If you don't know what you're doing is wrong, then what's the reason to change? Why, why would you want to change? So that's why you see some people, they are doing the wrong thing, but they are still proud of it. They are so proud of it because the devil has blinded them. They are, they are ready to blow themselves up for the devil if it's just to kill few Christians. Can you imagine that? They're so proud of it. I told you one time I met a guy, and he was Muslim, and he told me, that he participated in the state, in Kwara State, in Nigeria, when they were persecuting Christians. That he remembered it. He just got a machete, gave that guy, like, and he didn't know, like, that was wrong. Mind you, as at this time, he wasn't a Christian. But he's coming to a point, like, ah. And he told me that he didn't know what he was. He was even proud of it. And what caused it? I just had a relationship with him for a few months. And I thank God he saw Christianity in a different way. Like so, I could be a friend to a Christian. Now he felt like I shouldn't have. He did a degree in Islamic studies. I don't know what he's, but I, thank, I know a change is coming. I pray God ministers to him and he's a changed person because that's the kind of people you need in the kingdom. People that can relate to people that are still in the world. Like, no, I used to be like that. But that's not right. So you should be ashamed of your past life. But you shouldn't remain there. You have to be ready to change. The devil knows that if you make a change, he has lost you. So he wants to keep you there. Tell, keep telling you. There is no way of escape for you. You've gone too far to go to be accepted. Do you think you are worthy? Do you think you are like the other person? Think of what you have done. Oh, you killed somebody. Oh, you stole this. Oh, you lied against them. But Jesus knew everything. He knew about it. And is ready to forgive. Don't let your past deed keep you down. Remember this popular story of this family? It's a, it's a story, not real life. I don't know whether you have something similar happened in real life. But the story is that the father was a very strict man. He has two sons. And uh, he had this... Uh, glassware that was precious to him and he told the guys don't touch this thing it's so expensive i love it don't go near it and he kept it in you know that kind of thing you put it in a place where people can see it that's china i don't know why they call it china <laughs> The other brother went there, tried to look at it. In the process, he dropped it. And the father said, what is that? He said, nothing. Fortunately, he got it together. What will I do? He got some glue, 
put it around it, stick it, then put it there, gently. But the guilt was in him. <laughs> that, oh, this thing is broken. That's not the real, that's not the real cup. Then one day, the younger brother and the other brother were giving house chores to do. And when the parents are going out, the, other, the younger brother told him, Brother, I know what you did. He said, what did you do? What did I do? Do you think I didn't see you? When you broke that thing and used glue, I'm going to tell daddy. He said, please don't tell him. He said, okay, this is the deal. If you would do my house job with yours, then it will be fine. That guy said, cool. And he did that. Later, it was time to eat. I think I would need that chicken. <laughs> but it's mine. Well, I can go and tell daddy that you broke that cup. He said, oh, sorry. OK, you can have the chicken. And this is used over and over. That sense of guilt and sin he has committed to keep the other brother doing all the work he was supposed to do until the other brother felt this is enough. For how long will I continue with this? So one day, quietly, without the younger brother knowing, he went to the father and said, sorry, I did something you, you asked us not to do. I was examining that cup. Unfortunately, it broke. Though I glued it, but I know that's not the original cup. I've come to tell you the truth. The father was furious. But as a loving father, I said, don't worry. I forgive you. You know the fact? That cup was not the original one. I kept the original one elsewhere. I just want to use that to test whether you will listen to my instruction. So it doesn't mean much to me. The other brother went free. But the younger brother, they didn't know. <laughs> so like he usually does, another day to do our stuff, he said, <clears throat> go and do my portion with yours. The other said, are you something wrong with you? The other, younger brother was like, have you forgotten what you did? He said, what did I do? The cup, uh-huh, that you broke, really? He was using that until the other brother gave him a hot slap. Bam. He said, no, I will. I'll go and tell daddy. I, said, I don't care. So he went to that daddy. You know what happened? Daddy said, what happened? My other brother broke that, clock, that cup. He said, mm -hmm. I knew that days ago. So what's the new thing? Really, you knew? So what did you do? So what do you want me to do? In shame now was transferred to the brother, younger brother. You see, this is how the devil has been using your sin to harass you, to keep you down. And that raised the important point of confession. When we confess our sin, that means we acknowledge what we have done is wrong. After confession comes what? Forgiveness. We confess to show that we are not proud of what we did. And we have come to obtain forgiveness from God. That is one important thing we should remember in our Christian journey. Somebody wants to ask at the back. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Um, you were actually trying to say what I wanted to say. Mm -hmm. And um, in addition to what Pastor T said about forgiving yourself, we should also accept the forgiveness of God. 
there are sometimes God has forgiven you, but the enemy will keep coming, like he said, to remind us. And that takes us to First John 1, 9. It says, mm -hmm. if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us. But I, I like TPT, it says, but if we freely admit our sins, mm -hmm. when his light uncovers them, mm -hmm. he will be faithful to forgive us every time, every time. God is just to forgive us our sins because of Christ, and he will continue to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So even after repent and after confession, we come back to God, uh, there are sometimes you feel like you're falling again. Don't stay in that guilt and shame. The Bible says it will continue to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. That we forgive you everything. Even before you fall, he has already made provision for forgiveness. Just accept it, embrace the forgiveness, and move on. And tell the devil that he has no uh, glory over you. Amen. Thank you, thank you. Please accept the forgiveness that Christ is giving you. He is ready to forgive First, do you know you are a sinner? Do you get to the point that what you have done is wrong? If you start from verse 8 of First John chapter 1, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Some people don't know their sin. They, in fact, they are like, hmm, that thing is wrong. You know how people sometimes use other people's sin to justify their own sin? just to make themselves feel good. Right? They've been stealing millions. I only opportunity to thousands, and I stole that. This national cake. <laughs> and that's how the enemy wants it. But when you get to a point like, this is not right, then you will seek forgiveness. So if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. All unrighteousness. There is nothing that you have done that I cannot forgive you of. Nothing. So don't stay in that place of guilt when you have been forgiven. That brings us to the second point, renewing your mind. Renewing your mind. Sometimes you have to even remind yourself of what Christ has done for you. Probably you've stayed in that sin, in that place of guilt and shame for so long that we, we just forget that Christ's death covers everything. Please forgive yourself. Reject the lies of the enemy. Confront him with the word of God every time. Like Apostine will always say, if he wants to remind you of your sin, remind him of where he is going. You are condemned to hell. So stop disturbing me with my past. I have the opportunity for forgiveness. You cannot be forgiven. And your hand point, lake of fire. We have to renew our mind. Renew our mind all the time. Confession and repentance. Confession brings sin into light and diminishes its power. When we confess, then he has, sin has no power again. It will be like, so what? Uh huh. Because sin thrives in secrecy. But when it's exposed, So what? We also have to be accountable and receive support. 
So if you want to remain in Christ, you have to surround yourself with brethren, people that are also pursuing the light, people that are in Christ. If it means changing your friends, please do, because they can easily take you back to your old ways. You are a new man. You are a changed person. If you have to change your friends, change your friends. Because those are the people that will give you support. You will see examples to follow. They will teach you the way of the Lord. That is, you know, the group that we are influences us a lot, whether we know it or not. Because everybody wants to belong. So unconsciously, you begin to do what the group does. You talk the way they talk. If you've been in a place where all they do is uh, expletives all the time, before you know it, you start saying it. You start saying it. But if you change to where people speak words that edify, do things that are good, you find yourself doing the same thing. So don't forget the importance of being among those that will give you support and encouragement in the Lord. Finally, don't forget the importance of the Holy Spirit in empowering you. Many times we are weak. We feel like we don't know what to do. But his spirit empowers us. His spirit encourages us. Remember the disciples when Christ was about to go, they are like, please don't go. Say, I have to go. I just have to go. But when I go, I will not leave you without direction. I'm going to send the advocate. That's the Holy Spirit to guide you in all ways, in all things. Holy Spirit is our guide. He will teach us. He will remind us. He will direct us. So ask for the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. This is how you can take benefits of Christ dying on the cross for you and for me, not for himself. He died because of you and for me. He has come to do it. He has done it. The gate has been opened. He's done his job. But will you take advantage of the opportunity he has created? That is it. So if anything, please, wherever you are, wherever you are, don't be consumed by your past mistakes and your sins. Yeah, you are not proud of them. You feel ashamed. You feel guilty. That's just a starting point. Please don't remain there. Go to the next level. Be a changed person. Accept the forgiveness of Christ. Transform your mindset. Ask for forgiveness and he is going to forgive you. Remain in Christ. Be accountable and let the Holy Spirit empower you. I pray God will help us all in Jesus' name. We have to end here because of our time. Shall we bow down our heads for prayers? So our Father and our God, we thank you for your word again today. Lord, we thank you for what you did on the cross for us. What a great love. Father, we pray, O oh God, that you help us not to be consumed by the spirit of guilt and shame. But we will move on to accept what you have done for us. By acknowledging our sins and asking for forgiveness, we know you are faithful and just to forgive us all our sins and our righteousness. And so, Father, we pray that you empower us with your Holy Spirit to guide us, to teach us all things, so that we may remain in the way. We will be in the light always, and we'll do things that please you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Amen. Amen.